This is a post-Christian podcast. Welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. We are live on Facebook Live, and we're live uh, to record. <laughs> Welcome to Revolution, everybody. I'm glad you could be here. Um, this morning, um, I picked up Caleb, who broke his ankle two weeks ago in three different places, and is uh, luckily has a good friend who's put him up to help him out. Caleb is a very hard worker. He works all the time, and he's not able to work right now. And uh, a friend of his put together a fundraiser for him. What is it on? GoFundMe. On GoFundMe, which we have in the Facebook. If you go down a few pages, uh, go down a few posts, (laughs) two or three posts, and uh, you can go there and help Caleb out because he could use the help because we don't make a lot of money doing this crazy, Um, and his empire of uh, podcasts isn't really bringing in all the money either, so if you can help out Caleb, I'd appreciate it. We've got to get the guy back on his foot, (laughs) but this whole ministry is going to go straight to hell, (laughs) just like my dad, he likes to get real (laughs) dramatic, (laughs) Um, so yeah, he broke his leg, coronavirus, World's going to hell in a handbasket. Um, so, yeah. We got the coronavirus, finally. <laughs> it's waiting for Minneapolis. <laughs> and so we got it. Um, <clears throat> guy was on a cruise. Cruise ship. Cruise ship seems to be the grounds for, for uh, corona. And coronas. Um, <laughs> I'm a dad, okay? <laughs> Give me a break. You get, when you get a kids, you get a joke book. Um, yeah, so the world's going crazy. Um, so funny. People think my dad is selling a cure. It's not a cure, folks. It's not a cure. <laughs> he has not. I, I, I watch the video. I don't usually watch videos, the videos of my dad's stuff ever, you know, um, just because we're just trying to be buddies. But I watched this one, and I was like, okay, well, he never said it did cure it, but he never said it didn't. So there you go. (laughs) That's the best I can do. Um, But, yeah, I've got, you know, anytime my folks end in the media, I always get a few folks who are like, heads up, you know. I was like, oh, great, fun. Um, But, yeah, so that's going on, and I was in Puerto Rico Last week, for my first vacation, probably in, I mean, real vacation in, like, five years, I think, maybe longer. It was really great. Um, My friend Angel, who's from Puerto Rico, who we did a Meet Your Congregation, um, introduced me to some of his friends there. I got to meet another friend of mine named Angel there, who I knew from Instagram, and that was really great. He owns a coffee shop uh, called Communion. And uh, it was really cool. Got to see some cool street art and uh, go to some really cool dive bars. And, uh, yeah, it was very cool. So, um, But while I was there, I caught up on some reading, some Peter Rollins reading. Aren't we excited? I'm reading this so you don't have to. <laughs> um, but I thought I, I, today I actually I, I was really um, impressed. Don't tell Pete I said that. Um, I was really impressed by one of these one of the chapters in the book, and um, so I figured I'd, I'd read from that a little bit, even though I have an uncorrected proof and legally I'm not supposed to. But hopefully he he got it all sorted. Um, yeah, also been doing some podcasts. Lately, I've been on some different podcasts. Um, also, we do Loosen the Bible Belt podcast, which is a lot of fun, but we've had to take a break because we lost uh, one of our producers, and then their other producer uh, named Caleb broke his leg in three places, uh, walking home from work carrying three pizzas. Did the pizzas make it back? No. Okay. Are they still on the street somewhere? Nice. Um, 
He was bringing pizzas to people at church. It's because he's a good man. (laughs) (laughs) And kind of bummed I don't get any pizza today. Uh, What's the deal, dude? (laughs) We got to get this guy back at work. I'm like, um, or I don't get my specialty Caleb pizza. Um, No, so yeah, so, um, but I did this uh, Scotch and Good Conversation. Uh, podcast recently, check that out. I've got uh, Christy G's podcast I'm doing. We're doing a second one. Um, I just did another podcast that uh, some guys out of New York, and I'll let you know when that comes out, but I'm really excited about that one. So if people really want to know what a heretic I am, this one, when it comes out, I'll let you know, because it really... They asked me some pin, some yes and no questions. So it was, it was you know, great. <laughs> but yeah, so um, I'm going to read out of Insurrection today, and um, it's funny because part of the chapter I'm going to read from, it's a chapter within a chapter, um, is uh, do you believe in God? And so that's an interesting question. Um, and it becomes more of an interesting question of when, when you start to really study theology and as I've also taken a journey into reading some philosophy... Um, even stuff just as, as 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 like theologian philosopher Paul Tillich calling God the ground of all being, or um, as uh, John Caputo calls God the um, I got Caleb here to help me. Do you remember Caleb or too many pain meds, buddy? He calls him the unconditional, and so there's a lot of different concepts of of what God is and, and kind of taking the idea of God not being a man in the sky uh, idea, you know. And so what is God? And so I, I remember, you know, when I first met Pete, sitting down and asking him all these theological questions, you know, that I wanted yes or no answers to. I was that guy, you know. And I was pretty open and liberal and stuff, but I was like, do you believe in God? Yes or no? You know, do you believe in the resurrection? Yes or no? You know, and he would like explain it to me. I'm like, yes or no? You know, and and we laugh about that now, but because it's funny because I got that question. I did a uh, ask us anything on uh, Reddit and someone asked me like a yes or no question. What do you believe about Jesus? And I was like, well, um, is Jesus the son of God? Yes or no? And I'm like trying to be like, well, it depends on what you're mean by God. And I was like, oh, now I'm in that place answering, you know, trying to answer that question. And uh, so I thought this was uh, a pretty cool idea, a uh, pretty cool chapter. I'm probably not going to do it justice today, but, um, but yeah, let's just look at this chapter. I'm going to just read you the beginning of it and um, just the first part, the first paragraph. Um, what we discover here is that the question, does God exist, is not a straightforward one for the believer. Within the contemporary debate concerning the existence of God, the issue seems unambiguous, and everyone agrees with what, question, with what the question means. But the believer needs to ask the more fundamental question than this. That is, what does it mean to claim that God exists? So he also goes through, like, there's a response um, from different people, some variants, there's the no, which is the empirical atheism. Um, I don't know, which is the weak agnosticism. No one can know, strong agnosticism. Uh, or the question is irrelevant, agnosticism. <laughs> so those are kind of some of the ideas of, of how he looks at that. Um, but one of the things I really like is, um, he says in, in part of this book, he goes, for the believer who passes through the Christian experience God is no longer related to an object out there. Rather, God is affirmed only through a passionate participation in life itself. So, you know, growing up, for me, God was somewhere in the sky, you know, like in in space, in heaven, sitting down and, you know, had a little book and was, oh, Jay's being naughty again, you know. <laughs> oh, Jay did something good. <laughs> um, that kind of thing. 
And so God became this object out there that I was trying to uh, appease, you know, by good works and bad works, do's and don'ts. And that was what the idea I got from being raised as a Christian in the evangelical world was, is, you know, kind of this really walking on eggshells type of parent, you know, like freak out when you do something wrong. And, and I make deals with God all the time, you know, um, especially when I drank, especially when I got really sick and drank. I know there was a lot of toilet side conversations with God. God, if you just let me get through this night, I will never drink again. I've never told this story. I remember one time that I was dating my first wife, and I really liked her, but I wasn't sure she liked me. I remember going through all this stuff, and I was like, and I remembered I had a, a dirty magazine. <laughs> I was in ministry, and I had a dirty magazine. And I remember getting in my car, and I drove, and I found a garbage can in some mystic place, <laughs> threw it away, and I was like, all right, God, I'm getting rid of all that, that. If you'll just, you know, just let this girl really like me. I really like her, and I, I, I won't practice lust and, you know, all this stuff. And so I had all these deals I would make with God, you know, and, uh, you know, giving up and sacrificing. And, and now I realize that that's not God, you know. That's, that's you know, God, us creating God in our own image. And um, so I like this idea that... Um, that God is no longer an object out there. Caputo also calls it the event. The event. Caputo calls God the event. Yes. So theology and philosophy will make change your understandings of what God is and, and that type of thing. But this is where it gets really powerful and where I, I was even surprised by Pete. Um, it's so funny because his books sometimes are very, like, really grasp the Christian message. You know, really, I mean, why is that funny? He's a theologian and a philosopher, but still for me, I'm like, I guess because I know the guy. Um, you know, when we have our prayer meetings, I just didn't realize it. Um, but it goes, this means that we can no longer claim that we know God while hating our neighbor. So basically, he's like saying, like, God's no longer this thing up there. God is no longer this, 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 this object. But God is, is this, this something that we participate in. When we participate in life itself, this is God, living life itself. You know, and this is something that we see constantly. Like, you know, I mean, even when you think about when God, when the guy goes, well, God, we did all these, you know, things or whatever. And God said, when, I, when you were hungry, you did not feed me. You know, when I was in prison, you did not visit me. You know, you go, oh. So really it's this life thing of saying, how do we become, how do we become participants within God? So it really comes to the point of like believing if there's this man in the sky or believing exactly what God is or isn't, isn't the point. It's the point is, is are we participating within what God is? Are we participating in God? Are we living life that participates in this relationship? Ugh, it's mind boggling, right? He goes on to say, the one who has taken part in the event of conversion participation in the crucifixion and resurrection cannot claim to believe in God except so insofar as to love insofar as love eliminates from the transforming the world within which they are embedded so we can't say we've really taken you know claim that we believe in God except so insofar as our love eliminate eliminates from them transforming the world within which they are embedded. So is the world which we are embedded transformed? Do we believe in God? I'm going to get into it even further in a minute and put the old J spin on it. It goes on to say, goes, in other words, the claim I believe in God is nothing but a lie if it is not manifested in our lives because the only believes because one only believes in God in so far as one loves. So it doesn't become this idea of do I believe or not. You know, I mean, I believe you get grace 
period. I believe everyone receives grace. Everyone's accepted by something greater than, than they understand. But the idea is, is, how do we show that we believe in God? You know, what do I love when I love my God is the question. And I've always believed the answer to that question is the other. Others. That's who we love. You know, we love each other. And, and it becomes a per- something that we participate in. And become participants in this. You know, in the Bible it says, they will know you belong to me by your love for one another. Not by the fact that you believe or don't believe. Not the fact that you make a statement or you have a mission statement or that you're a member of a really cool church or, you know, you've got really cool Jesus tattoos, which I do. (laughs) Guilty as judged. Um, Doesn't make a difference. Do I participate? What does that look like? Well, let's go on and see what old Mr. Rollins has to say here. In Christianity, to believe in God means nothing other than to be the site where love is born. That's beautiful, right? We're to find the courage to affirm the world and live fully into it. I mean, that's been like my life goal this past year is to live a life well and live into it. You know, not always easy, you know. Um, And this is the one that really got me and I really like a lot. Um, And then we'll get into 1 John here in a second. Um, As he goes, so far as Christians, a new range of answers to the question, do you believe in God arises? Answers such as, I aspire to ask my friend, I, I aspire to ask my friends, or more importantly, to talk to my enemies. So the idea is, is, you know, do you believe in God? Could you imagine saying, like, I inspire to talk to my enemies? That being your answer. People are like, what? But that's it. You know, love God. You know, I love my enemies. I love those who persecute me. I love my friends. You know, I inspire to be a better friend to my friends. I inspire to love my enemies. So it doesn't all of a sudden become this thing of like, do you believe in the man in the sky or do you believe in this or the ground of all being or the unconditional or the whatever, you know, it's like, no, I inspire to love my enemies. Now, I wish I would have had that years ago when I was like being asked to like sit down and talk to atheists on television, which I've done a few times and, and uh, they'd be like, what do you believe in God? What is God? And I could just be like, I inspire to love my enemies. <laughs> <laughs> what what do you mean? <laughs> you know, just give him those kind of like Pete Rollin answers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, these aren't the droids you're looking for. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and, and he ends it with this, and this is one that I've had people use against me for grace and stuff, so this is one I found really funny. But he did say this. He's like... Um, Because he's asking, he's like, yet yeah, isn't this the type of heresy that brings us close to the very heart of Orthodox Christianity? Is this, you know, is this right? he goes, as the book of James makes clear, the demons of hell can't, can be said to have correct empirical understanding of reality, and yet it does them no good at all. Because, in, you know, and James is like, even the, de- even the devils believe in God, you know? So he's saying, um, just, so just believing isn't, isn't what it's about. It's beyond belief, you know. But my whole thing was, you know, growing up was I had to say a prayer. I had to accept that I believed it. I had to raise my hand with no one, with every eye closed and every head bowed, you know, and then got tricked into being like, now if you really meant it, you're going to stand up in front of everybody. And I'm like, why was the eyes closed and the head bowed thing? Guys, if I have to stand up and come down front, because if you're ashamed of God, you'll be ashamed of you, you know. I'm like, really? It was like bait and switch. You know, but I got so used to hearing that five thousand times a night that uh, I didn't realize that that was a bait and switch. Now, here we go. So, do I believe in God? Yes, I desire to love my enemies. So, we're going to go into First John four, First uh, John four seven, which is one of my favorite parts of the Bible. Do I say that every week? Whenever I read from the Bible, 
This is one of my favorite parts of the Bible. I just, I just love the Bible so much. Um, definitely not a perfect collection of writings, but there are some I dig a lot. And the idea, like the concept of God as love is something that I grew up with, and I wish I would have known that that was more of the answers I was looking for. Because even if you look at like um, Mother Teresa, you know, when, you, when they've gone back and look at some of her writings and where she's like, I don't feel God's presence anymore. I don't feel like God's here. I don't know if I believe in God anymore. You know, that kind of thing. She continued to do her work, you know, and I've read that someone once said that that was the ultimate presence, that was the ultimate, that was the kingdom of God and work. Is it didn't matter if she believed or not, you know. What mattered was, is that she still loved, she still did her work, she still cared about people, you know. And I remember when those, those letters first came out, the new, the new atheists were like, see, look, even she had, you know, she didn't believe in God sometimes, and they thought it was really awesome, and they were like, see, this shows that it's, you know. And it's great because you can now you can say, like, well, that's missing the point. Actually, she was more in tune with God when she did not believe in God because she was being Christ crucified. Because the, Christ said, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me on the cross? Like, where have you gone? Everything was gone. Friends were gone. God was gone. It was gone. You know, and she shared in that suffering. I don't think we get that. We think sharing in the suffering means like, you know, pain and hurt and all this. But sometimes it's just saying, I don't feel like God's there anymore. And for me, you know, going through what I went through the past year, I've, I'm, I'm luckily coming out of it and, and life is getting better, though. But with my depression, my mental breakdown, going to the, the psych ward, you know, getting electric shock therapy, I mean, all that was horrible. And I really did struggle to feel like there was no God anymore. Like, no God, nothing. Where's God? Where's Jesus? And it was strange because Pete um, Rollins has been my best friend for 10 years now. Um, I read, I never really read his books. I mean, I've heard him speak a million times. Um, even when I ask him not to, but I read one of his. I read his book, um, one of his books, and that was in there. That you know, to share in the crucifixion is to be abandoned by God. You know, that, that share that moment and cross that across. And but uh, God, why have you forsaken me? And all of a sudden, I went. For the first time in my life, I felt like I'm actually closer to Christ than I've ever been because I don't feel God there anymore. I feel forsaken by God. And I, now I understand what that suffering is. I understand what it is, what that's like. And, and so it was like, it was one thing that kind of gave me some peace to get out of that situation. You know? It's so strange that things that, that we take for granted or that we miss or you know, or we want to read over, you know, I mean, no one ever focused on that, why God, why my God, why God have you forsaken me? No one ever preached on that when I was growing up. They kind of ran over it and then got over to the resurrection and everything was happy, you know. Um, and I probably have more in, 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 in line now. I feel closer to Christ. I feel closer to Thomas, you know, like who wants to put his hands in the hole, wants the proof. But the thing is, he's still living there. He's still with the disciples. He's still with them, but he's like, I don't know about this. I need evidence, you know? And uh, there's something beautiful about that in, in our life, and doubt is just part of it. Uh, someone just, I don't, I'm not supposed to read my Facebook message, but I'm going to read it right now anyway. A completed God is not God. I like that. Someone just wrote that. Um, so let's jump into 1 John 4, 7. <sighs> Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. You know, if you take that 
literally, then who you think believes in God and doesn't believe in God is going to change. You're going to see like Leonardo DiCaprio trying to save the world and go like, oh, maybe Leo loves God and you know, maybe Pastor Jay doesn't love God as much as Leo. <laughs> you know, it's those things though. I mean, you, you see people all over showing love. You see people showing compassion. And I think that's, um, you know, if we're known by our love for one another, then is it necessary that we have it figured out what God is? Not really, because you can't figure out God. As soon as you figure out God, God ceases to be God. You know, once I theologically got all the, everything checked, oh, that's God, then that's not God. If I can understand that God, if I can give you the concept and tell you what it is, how is that God if God is, you know, uh, Caputo said God doesn't ex- exist, he in- God insists. You know, and I was, was like really struggled with that for years. And now I'm getting kind of a better grasp of like, oh, do I believe in God? Yeah, I want to love my enemies. So whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. Um, now we could really get into some ideas of what love is and what love isn't and, and, and things like that. We're just going to kind of try to take it for a little bit just take it for what it is right now and not get too deep into that today. But it goes on to say, God's love was revealed amongst us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this, and this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the atonement sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, be loved, beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is perfected in us. And it comes from loving. Um, so I'm going to, you know, challenge a lot of you the next time someone asks you if you believe in God... Just say, yeah, I'm trying to love better. And see what they say. You know? Yeah, I, I'm trying to love better. You know, I try to love my enemies. You know? By this we know we abide in him and he in us. Sorry for all the pronouns, but Paul wasn't hip to the scene yet. Um, I usually try to read around them, but uh, I'm really tired right now, so I'm having a hard time switching up the language. Um, And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as a Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. So now, see, it's funny because it's like, oh yeah, you know you're Christian because you believe that Jesus sent the you know, God sent His Son and blah blah blah. But then it just finishes with, we believe the love that God has for us. So it also just comes back and boils down to, but we believe the love that God has for us and that we have for others. Love has been perfected among us in this. Oh, no, no, no. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love, um, love has been perfected amongst us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. So if God is love, so as God is, so are we in this world, then we are to love. That's understanding the presence of God. Blah. What is God? Does God exist? Hey, I'm trying to love. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. And it's, it's strange, this verse is always kind of, I've always struggled with this because I've always, you know, read verses, there's like, well, you've got to fear God, you know. 
but when I was younger, I remember reading a lot of Brennan Manning and Brennan Manning uh, saying, you know, well, what does the fear of God actually mean? And he, and he goes into the Greek and the Hebrew and the traditions of the word and it was awe, wonder, and reverence. You know, it's not this, you know, because if perfect love casts on all fear and God is love, then why would we go, oh, I'm afraid? You know, it was saying, no, you still have awe and wonder and reverence because you don't know what God is. But you know God is love, and I know when I love others, I experience God. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. So if we're constantly worried about punishment, so every time you know someone says, like, oh, God sent the coronavirus, or God sent the hurricane, or God sent the earthquake, you know, this is this idea of this freaking scary, freaky God that's just crazy, and all of a sudden Jesus' death, you know, if, there, if atonement theory is right, then Jesus' death wasn't enough for that, I guess. Um, it's so funny, people who are like dead set on atonement theory also believe God sends like weather catastrophes and diseases. It doesn't ever make any sense to me. I'm like, well, but what about the pain? You know, it just doesn't add up, right? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense theologically. Um, but perfect love casts out all fear. So, it, so when we hear people threatening people with fear in the name of God, we can, how the Bible says, you'll know them by your love. So if you see them threatening other people with fear, causing fear, like, oh, you're going to go to hell and burn forever, or God's going to hate you, or God's going to break your car down, or send a hurricane, you know, then you can know that the person saying those things has not been perfected in love. Now, they might be a Christian, you know, in certain, you know, in their life. They might even believe God exists as a man in the sky, whatever. Um, the Apostles' Creed, they might check all the boxes. But if they're preaching fear, if they're telling you to be afraid, if they're telling, you know, you're horrible, then the chances they have not been perfected in love. It's growth. It takes time. Evolution happens over time. You know, it's not saying you have to be perfect, but it's saying if you're living in fear, love hasn't been perfected in you. And I know for my life is so long living in fear that, you know, all it did was throw a wedge between me and faith and me and whatever concept of God I held at the time. There was a wedge that I couldn't connect with and a wedge between Jesus, a wedge between Paul, a wedge between all these things because this fear kept me from being able to examine my faith to the fullest because I was so worried about what I was or wasn't doing. So now I'm not worried about what I'm not or not doing. I mean, more or less is like, how do I love people or how do I express and encourage others to love others? Because I always feel like that's kind of what I'm called to do is to help people love each other more. You know, to see the church become a safer place. To see human beings, you know, love each other and not use fear tactics on one another. I mean, and I think that's one of the things that's got me so like crazy about this coronavirus is just seeing how the media just strikes us with so much fear, you know? And so, like, the point isn't like, oh, is the coronavirus going to wipe us all out? Probably not. But if everybody gets afraid and runs to the, you know, grocery stores and there's no groceries left and everybody gets afraid and, like, runs to the bank or something and pulls all their money out and there's no money left, you know, that's, that's a de devastation, but that's just a reaction from fear, because everyone's so afraid. And so, I mean, that's how the media keeps going, is like by fear. I mean, if you see how that's how politics works, you know, if Trump is president for four more years, everything is going to be horrible. Your life is going to fall apart. Everything's going to be bad. I'm not saying it's going to be great because I don't know who's going to win uh, the next, in the next uh, election. Um, but I know we've survived through some pretty bad presidents. And we've survived some, through some pretty good ones and then later found out they weren't that great. You know what I mean? Like, life has gone on. When I went and saw Henry Rollins, like a few days after Trump became president, he's like, all right, everybody, 
we've survived this type of thing before. And he started talking about Nixon and all these different things. Like, you know, it's not great, but we survive. We'll survive it. We'll make it through it, you know. And, 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 and the sad thing is not everybody has survived. You know, these kids in cages have died. Kids have died and people have gone through that. But unfortunately, we suffer that through every leader we choose. I mean, that's what I don't think why I can't put any politician, like especially a president, on a pedestal is because they control the army. You know? They have to make really bad, tough decisions. That I, I mean, I don't know how anybody would want the job. You know, because you're going to kill people. You know? So we were like, oh, our, Bernie's going to save the day. And I, I like him. Um, you know, but I still think he's going to make some, have to make some really horrible decisions. And I'm grateful that I don't. Um, but the idea is, is that if we live a life in fear, constantly afraid, then we aren't experiencing love. If people are, are constantly showing us, throwing fear at us, they're not really loving us. Um, and I'm glad to live in a life where I'm just like, you know, somebody the other day said, uh, was texting me about the virus, the coronavirus, and was like, you're the only person I know who's not freaking out about this. What's going on? You know? And I was like, well, when you grow up, part of your life, hearing your dad talk about things that are going to end the world and being prepared for that, um, <laughs> you kind of become numb to it, you know? Um, numb to that stuff and you're just kind of like well life we're going to live life and I'm just going to live the best I can and you know whatever happens happens you know I'm going to you know do my best to take care of my kids and and people around me but you know I've heard this these scenarios most of my adult life you know just for other reasons and also, I don't know if you all remember, like, things like the blue, uh, the bird flu and, and uh, mad cow disease and uh, SARS. SARS, yeah. I mean, remember all that stuff? We, Ebola. God, I mean, we've, all, we've gone through a lot of these different things before. I mean, of course, when you're right in it, you're like, this time it's different, though. <laughs> <clears throat> um. But perfect love casts out all fear. Let's look at that. So if we're to live a life, if, if, that's, if we're trying to look back and step back and go like, all right, I'm going to live a life where I'm not going to live in fear. I'm going to live a life well. I'm going to let love be embedded in my life. And I'm going to realize that it doesn't matter as a Christian what my opinion of God is as long as I'm loving better. I'm loving the other. That's pretty radical, you know. And you say, "Well, yeah, I just can't figure that. I can't accept that completely." That's okay. That that's what grace is there for. I've never, I never, I didn't know, haven't always accepted that completely. And sometimes I don't, you know. Sometimes I still struggle with that. But I know I have grace too, which also gives me the chance to just develop these thoughts and these ideas as I grow. Is accepting grace and just knowing that I'm okay. You know, I'm going to work through this. And I'm going to help others work through it. And we have the grace to do that. So I'm not saying that everybody who goes around and says live a life of fear, excuse me, live a life of fear isn't a Christian or isn't a, you know, spiritual or isn't a good person. I'm just saying they just haven't grown fully within love yet. And I think we're all going to that. I don't think any of us has arrived at uh, you know, love. I'm still a very selfish person and I'm a very introverted person and I feel like if I was like Superman of love, I'd be like, I can't be an introvert, and I'm going to go out, and I'm going to go on the streets, and I'm going to feed everybody, and I'm going to do all that. You know what I mean? There's all these things, like, when I think about them, like, there's all these things I don't do. Um, but I know that love is evolving in me and perfecting in me. And I know that love for different people, how they show love, people have different love languages, different ideas of what love is, and different ways they express love. And so we'll also be wise to tune into that and not pick one person to be the representation of love, but to see all people as different representations of love and how that works. We love because God first loved us. 
those who say I love God and hate their brother or sister are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. So that kind of backs up Pete's claim. You know, do you believe in God? Yeah, I want to love my friends more. I want to love my neighbor as myself. You know, that answer. That, 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 it's right there. How can you love a God you can't see if you can't love someone you can see? That's very Paulinian. I'm Pete's a very Paulinian theologian. Um, you know, even though we're in First John and not in Paul, but still. The commandments we have from God is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. And so this is, this is it. I mean, this is the kind of concept is, you know, what's important? Is it important having the perfect theology? Is it important having God figured out? Is it important how you answer the question, do you believe in God or not? Or is Jesus the Son of God? Um, how do you accept that? Now, given, you know, you know, it, it, orthodoxy, you know, especially in America, that would be like you have to say yes, and you have to say yes, and then you have to say no, you have to say no. And um, but I'm saying, look at a, take a radical look at this, take a radical approach of it, step back from it a little bit, step like back from the history a little bit, and go. Those aren't the important questions. Those are great conversations to have at a pub or at dinner and sit down with your friends and, and, and talk that out, you know, and is there God, isn't there God? You know, I love those conversations. I have a great time having those conversations. But what's, what's really important is stepping back and going, you know, not if I, what, I, what I believe God is or isn't, but do I love? And not seeing that as a ticket to eternity. That's another problem is we get distracted by eternity and then go like, oh, well, if I love, then do I get to go to heaven? What it's saying is embed love in your life. Life now. Live it now. It's not saying after, it's not talking about the afterlife. It's saying how do we live in this world now? Embed love into it. We do not realize how much of what Christ taught, what Paul taught, what some of the, a lot of the books in the Bible teach, is about living life before death. Somehow we've become so focused on the afterlife that we've forgotten what we're supposed to do here and be here, and that we this is all we have. Eternity is not guaranteed for anyone. We don't even know what that means completely. If we don't know what God is completely, we don't know what eternity is completely. But we have the here and now, and is life embedded in our life? Is love making our life worth living now? Are we living life well? And when we're living life well, are we loving others, and are we allowing ourselves to be loved by others and through others? And are we allowing that to change our life? Because most of my relationships that have changed my life and made me better is coming from the fact of allowing people to be in a relationship where they love me and even love me enough to tell me the truth. Love me enough to tell me when I'm like off base or when I'm missing it or that, you know, Jay, I think you need to go to the psychiatrist. I think you maybe need to go to a therapist, you know, because I think you might be missing this or I think there's something else inside you or some chemicals that might be imbalanced going on right now making you think this way. But, you know, learning is love embedded in your life. That's, I guess that's another reason they call it good news. I mean, because that's good news to me. And then we can sit down over, you know, a Diet Coke and a beer and, you know, decide if God's dead or alive or whatever, you know. So right now, as I'm asking, is love embedded in your life? And are you willing this week... Well, not this week, just next time someone asks you if you believe in God to answer the question, like, yeah, I'm trying to love my enemies more. If you do, please put in the comment section what happened in Facebook or tweet me and let me know because that would be really interesting because for a lot of people, that is not going to be a very good answer. Um, (laughs) 
I should have used that in my ask me anything answer. Yeah, I'm trying to love my enemies more. The guy would have been like, you know. Or maybe someone should ask me that on Twitter so I could answer that. So then I could see people's responses to it. We'll do a little setup, um, see what happens. Anyway, um, that's all I got for you today. Um, as, as I've said in the past, good luck with that. Um, right now, as usually we do Q&A, we have the mic here. Would you mind? We're going to do this, and um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get on to all the questions on Facebook Live, because our, our, my assistant, Caleb, is literally came today. I went and picked up Caleb today, and he's literally sitting right over there, and he has uh, a gigantor bandage around his leg, a walker, and with that bandage is huge pieces of metal sticking in and out of his leg because he broke it in three places. So I won't make him take the offering today is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Caleb, could you use the mic and uh, hobble around? We want to see if we can break it in fuller places. Um, so, yeah, is there anybody, any, any questions or comments in the, uh, in the crowd? Oh. <laughs> oh. Caleb starts it off. I think the mic's on. Uh, yeah, man, I love what you said today, dude. And I think that the conversation of like, like the debate of like, does God exist, does not exist, is getting really exhausting, I think, to me personally. It's, it's like, because I hang out with, you know, there are groups that I meet with some regularly who are, you know, former fundamentalists or who are, you know, explicitly like atheists and stuff like that. And just the conversation, of the debate of the existence or non-existence of God, it's just like, I'm, I'm getting kind of tired of it and kind of yeah. o- over it. And I think that just, that, yeah, like, I mean, you know, actions speak louder than words. And what you espouse as personal conviction really just, at the end of the day, doesn't really matter that much. And like I've said, I, I did a talk before on this about how, you know, in Matthew 25, on, in Judgment Day, the thing that separates the goats from the sheep isn't, well, did you go to church or, you know, did you say the sinner's prayer? It's, did you help me when I was a homeless person? Or, you know, did you, did you feed someone who was hungry? You know, it's how you treat people, how you live in love, not how you, um, not what doctrines you cling to or, or, or can recite, you know, or what beliefs you claim to have. And, and speaking of Pete Rollins, a bit, another big point that he makes is a lot of times people, don't realize what they do or don't believe. People who claim to believe in God, you know, if, if really pressed on it, um, it's it, they're really just kind of reciting rhetoric that they've memorized and stuff like that. And and it, it can be tricky to to know what you actually quote unquote believe, I guess. But maybe it doesn't matter near as much as how you you know how you treat people, which is biblically in, in Luke it says, out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. You know, so maybe it's where your heart is at and. That then your actions and your words kind of follow from there, and not not in specific doctrines that you prescribe to or don't. Sorry, I'm scanning through questions as you oh, okay. comment. Anybody else here on in the live crowd? Or I mean, here in Revolution at the bowling alley. No, you guys all think my talk was perfect. I appreciate that. What I love is people are having more conversations with each other online than they want to with us, so that's really good. Oh, and also we're wrangling up more Meet Your Congregations if anyone wants to message, message me on uh, Instagram. We're starting to look at scheduling some of those. Pending my recovery, or we could do it from, from my recovery bed. Yeah, we could. <laughs> we could potentially do that. It's my first outing since the... In two weeks, look at this. I'm gonna be sleeping all day after this. What's wiping out the young people and others is the fear placed by evangelical church. Yes, I'm political, but I'm so tired of it now. Laugh out loud. Yes, aren't we all? We should have like short. We should only let them run for a little bit. <laughs> We're tired. Here, let's see if I can get this one. This looks interesting. A rabbi once told me Israel's name means to struggle with God, and the process of faith means to struggle with the text and to struggle with God. 
it's okay and important to ask questions that the rabbi, that rabbi set me free from the evangelical teachings of the day. Yeah, the media is also the problem. I got you there. <laughs> wow, everybody's talking to each other. This is good. They don't need you anymore. They don't need me. I'm glad. I like the talk. If I disagree, I'll hug you while we disagree. That's nice. Aw, Caleb. <laughs> Yay, Caleb. I'm reading those though just how they're written. We love you. So glad you're here. Thank you. Stud it, Caleb. <laughs> Stud it. I like that. I don't know what that means, but I like it. Silly debate. Get out there and love. Okay, well. A perfect talk. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm loving it. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Another dad joke for the day. Um, I don't think McDonald's is going to endorse your theology. You don't think McDonald's is going to endorse my theology? I watched that documentary last <laughs> night on the scam, on the, on the McDonald's game scam. The, um, the, oh, the Monopoly? The, the Monopoly scam. Yeah, and like how like, like the like organized crime got in on the Monopoly thing and like, really? Took it over, yeah. It's pretty, pretty amazing. It's a documentary on HBO. You guys should check it out. All right. Well, Kurt. Kurt no, not even Kurt. Kurt's even like this is perfect. <laughs> um. All right. Well, guys, have a great week out there. Have a great week, and um, if we'd love it if you want to help Revolution out, you can go to revolutionchurch.com. But I really love it. If you went down a couple uh, posts and uh, linked to um, Caleb's GoFundMe, um, because he's not able to work right now, and the guy has been working ridiculously full-time hours and doing Revolution and doing about four other podcasts, um, so he you know doesn't have a ton of money, and you know it takes money to live. So if you guys could help him out, that would be really great, and. Um, if you're a millionaire, then you can also help Revolution out at revolutionchurch.com. <laughs> I don't know why we don't have more millionaires. Do they not spend time on Facebook? <laughs> All right. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks for listening. Our ministry is supported 100% by listeners like you. To make your 100% tax-deductible donation today, please visit revolutionchurch.com slash donate. You can also learn more by clicking the donate section on the website. If you enjoyed this show, you might also like Loosen the Bible Belt with Kristen Becker and myself, Jay Baker. What do you think we should do? I mean, if we, is there a way for us to be loving and compassionate to people who are on a journey and might not completely understand where you know, like where we're at yet or haven't arrived to accept the idea of a trans pastor or a gay pastor. I mean, do we cut them out or do we try to create a space for them to come along? You know, I think that everyone deserves the opportunity to come along if that's what they want. And I don't believe that uh, the progressive folks um, or any, you know, folks should demean or diminish anyone whose opinion or thoughts or perspectives are different. Now, what I do hope we do um, as people with a more progressive lens, uh, but I still kind of consider myself to be conservative in some respects, uh, but what I do hope the progressive uh, movement uh, does is provide uh, education and opportunities for people to really be uh, educated about their options and their perspectives and what their choices are. I think we shouldn't polarize the religious landscape. I think we should just offer as much information as possible so that people are making informed decisions. That was a post-Christian podcast. <laughs>